uh, start talking about the PCBS uh, regulations, right? And how is it that the Rajasthan Government of Banking Supervision decides in dividing the portfolio into retail and commercial? So first, uh, the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that the objective of the PCBS is to help the bank set aside the capital. If the bank has to set aside a capital, the question that comes out is that how do we segregate the portfolio? So obviously, your capital would be kept aside basis your riskiness, and your riskiness will be measured by your exposure. So the portfolio which has the greater exposure will be the more risky portfolio, right? So that's where, therefore, uh, PCBS regulation segregates the borrowers or segregates the accounts in terms of, or segregates the portfolio in terms of the exposures that they have, right? Because capital or your RWA, your risk-weighted assets, is maintained for each account and out of, of a given portfolio. And so basically you need to ensure that the portfolio that you are keeping aside is or the account that you are keeping aside is something which is <coughs> or the account that you are keeping aside is proportionate to your exposure. Right? So for a larger for an account which has a larger exposure, there would be a larger RWA which is kept aside. For uh, asset for asset which have a small exposure, a smaller RWA would be kept aside. Otherwise, if the bank keeps aside a large, uh, say a very high value of RWA for each of his account, then it would be unnecessarily stuffing our, uh, you know, stuffing of capital, paying interest on that, and it would be foregoing profitable funds. So therefore, the BCBS defines all its products all its portfolios in terms of its exposures, exposures, right? So when I talk about the exposures, so what do I mean by exposure? When, uh, so there are two things which I need to clarify. First of all, the first point that comes out over here is, that what is a portfolio? The first question that comes out over here is that what is what exactly is a portfolio? So the portfolio that we have over here is so a portfolio is defined as a collection of accounts. So basically, when I say that I'm talking about the credit card portfolio, what it means is. And I'm talking about the credit cards, uh, or I'm talking about the list of an account or a group of accounts of credit cards. So that's called a collection of credit cards. So a collection of accounts is a portfolio. Right, so a collection of accounts is a portfolio for a bank. So when you talk about a credit card, it is a collection of accounts of borrowers who have taken credit card. If I talk about a collection of, uh, if we talk about a collection uh, uh, or a personal loans portfolio, it means the collection of accounts which has taken a personal loan, right? So, so that's what a portfolio is. So when and each of the portfolio, so whenever you are giving a loan to a particular borrower, you are creating an exposure. It is this exposure for which capital needs to be made in because each of these exposures would have a part of it as expected loss, the other would be the unexpected loss. So there is something which you can measure, you know. So you will have an average loss to measure from this, uh, from this uh, for each of these accounts and there would be a variance from this loss. 
So every account would be, for every account there would be an expected, for every account there would be an unexpected loss, right? Let's say a macroeconomic downturn happens, a sudden crash happens, and majority of the borrowers suddenly lose their jobs, and the delinquency of the borrowers suddenly spikes up, and then they spike up, you know. So if the repayment capacity faces a deterioration, their delinquency data spikes up. So this is what you get to see. Right. So over here, so over here, what happens is you have a portfolio, right? So and for each portfolio, and, and this is the portfolio you need to for each account you need to keep a certain RWA. So obviously you will be doing it as per its exposure. And how is that exposure created? So when you give a loan to a borrower, the exposure is right there, right? So I take a loan of one lakh, so for the bank. If the bank increases its receivables by one lakh at the same time, it increases its exposure by one lakh, right? And basis is exposures, right? The bank's portfolio is divided into two parts. One is the retail portfolio. And the other is the commercial portfolio. A retail portfolio and the next is the commercial portfolio. So, and both these portfolios are defined in terms of their exposures, right? So let's see how is it that a retail portfolio is defined. Now, now a retail portfolio typically has two important characteristics. The first characteristic that it has is that it has a large number of borrowers. So the number of borrowers is large. And the second is that the exposure of each of the borrowers is very less. Right? So it's very small exposures. It's a very small exposure. Now, when I see a very small exposure, uh, how do I say, uh, you know, in what terms do I say that, yeah, it's a very small exposure? So, uh, how small is small? So, over here, Basel has a cutoff. It says that, okay, if your exposure is less than 1 million euro, then your exposure is truly a small exposure. The small exposure is less than euro 1 million if I if what I have is less than 1 million euro then then I'll say that the exposure is a small exposure in the retail exposure so what we have the next part that has that we have is large number of followers now let's think about the different retail products. So what are the different retail products? So one of the retail products that we know is let's say credit cards. Credit cards is one of the most widely used retail product and it's very easy to understand uh, the concept of retail portfolio as by, by defined by Basel to so this uh, the credit cards. Then if you think about a bank's credit card portfolio. So what is the average number of uh, borrowers or uh, accounts that a bank generally has? It is anywhere between uh, 3 million to 10 million. Say 3 million to 4, uh, 3 million to 5 million. 
and I'm saying this is for a typical large bank or a large bank. for a typical large bank, right? Now, for, you know, for relatively smaller portfolios, it can be 1 million to 5 million, something like that. So, so basically, it's more than a million. So there are more than a million number of records that a bank has on the credit card portfolio. But what is the size? What is the ticket size of each loan or of each account? That's very small, right? So, what would be a typical uh, limit which is extended to credit card holder? 5,000, 10,000, uh, $4,000, something like that. So, basically, or $2,000, something like that. So, basically, what would happen over here is that the overall ticket size of each of these accounts is very less. But, given that the huge spread of the borrowers for the same product, what you get to see is that the total exposure from these products can be increased, right? And hence, it becomes very important to manage these products. So one very important characteristic of retail is that the number of borrowers are large borrowers and the number of, uh, and the exposure of each account is less than 1 million euro. Now, let's say I have given the card to a particular business house, right? But if but if the product is less than, but if the overall exposure is less than 1 million euro, then you know that, that this particular product is, or this particular borrower, the, the person whom you've given the loan, right, uh, who should be managed as a retail borrower, even if he is a business personality, right, or if that loan has been a kind of given to a small business. But, but over here, it's not about the obligor who is taking the loan, but it's about the exposure that he is creating for the bank. Right? So whatever is not retail is commercial. Right? So any any loan which is below or which is above 1 million euro is a commercial portfolio for in terms of Basel. Now, Basel obviously has different ranges of come uh, with the commercial portfolios you, you may have small and medium scale enterprises you will have corporations and you will have uh, you know so you will have corporates and uh, yeah so also so corporates and so on so basically so broadly there will be two types of borrowers one are SME borrowers right who, who, who vary between 1 to 10 million euro and maybe more than 10 million, uh, an exposure of more than 10 million is treated as a corporate. So, so each of these three are the, the different kind of, uh, what we can say. So, so these are the different cutoffs for the classification. So, we will not go into the commercial portfolio right away, right? So, we we'll first of all look into the retail portfolio in details. Because when whenever we are developing our models over here, we are doing that or we would be doing that in terms of uh, mostly in terms of the retail products like personal loans, credit cards, uh, point of sales, finance and so on. So we'll be having it in different ways, right? So over here, uh, so let's start talking about the way the particular retail portfolio of a bank is structured and how is it that this retail portfolio is defined under the Basel regulation. So, so that's what we are going to do. So, talking about the retail portfolio, uh, <coughs> the Basel records it define it divides the retail portfolio into two parts, rather into three parts. One of the part is your QRI, or as we call it. The qualifying revolving retail exposures. Where it is, it is Q R R P. -R 
right? So what we have over here is URL. QRRE stands for the Qualifying Revolving <coughs> Retail Exposures. So this is basically this segment comprises of products like credit cards, overdrafts, and other such revolving products. So the first question that comes out over here is that what is a revolving product? So we'll come to that. So the next part that we have over here is So after QRRE, the next part that we have over here is mortgages. So what are mortgages? So mortgages are uh, assets or, you know, so mortgages are those assets which we use for, so, uh, so which is a kind of secured lending. So basically when we buy a house, so it, it, it's basically the home loans portfolio, right? So the two broad divisions are, one is QRRE, which is, which stands for qualifying revolving retail exposure and the next is mortgages the third that we have over here is the other retail right what we have over here is the other retail So over here, so, so these are the three broad segments. Right? Now, what happens over here is, so, so let's take up each of these segments and let's explore them. <coughs> so QRRE is nothing but the qualifying revolving retail exposures. So even when you know, uh, when you look into the name, the way it has been defined, it is defined in terms of exposures. So what is a revolving product? So a revolving product has two broad characteristics. So QRE products have two broad characteristics. The first is, it is an unsecured portfolio. So if it is unsecured, it means that that there is no security behind it. So basically when you take a credit card, you just take the card, right? So you are just assessed whether you should get the card or not and then you are given the card. You are not asked to keep aside any kind of, you know, security for that particular card product and so on. So what you do is, you just use that card. So that is your unsecured portfolio. You do not give any security or mortgages against that. The second characteristic of this uh, QRRE portfolio is that uh, the most important pro <coughs> the thing is that it's a revolving product. So now coming to the concept of revolving. What do you mean by credit which revolves? What it means is that there, number one, there is no definite timeline for that product to get expired. Right? So talking about this unsecured product, yeah, so the next question, next characteristic as we said is the revolving characteristics and revolving mean life that there is no maturity date. So the products do not come with a maturity date. right so revolving products do not come with any maturity dates so how do they work so what happens is you are given a line of credit right let's say you are given the authority to use or to have one lakh rupees as a hundred thousand dollars as a limit now what you do is you go and you swipe your card right and you make purchases 
as long as you do not reach and you hit that limit of one lakh or you hit that limit of hundred thousand dollars, you know that that is not going to. Uh, so you can use that card, but the moment you hit it, your card stops and your transaction doesn't work because you have used up the entire limit. Now when so now you don't have any credit left with you. So now what you do is you pay back some part of it. Let's you pay back 50% of that limit. When you pay back that limit, remaining 50% of that limit, what you have over here is the outstanding balance. So say you pay back 50,000. So the limit on your card now is 50,000. Again, you can use it. So every time you're using the card, you're losing out on your credit. Then you're paying it back again and you can use your credit. So your credit is always revolving in nature. So it does not have uh, any security associated with it and it is absolutely revolving in nature and this is what makes it the most important product. So this is what it makes this product one of the most risky segments and that is the reason why you know the APRs on or the annual percentage rate of interest is the highest. So on credit cards you will see that the APRs are the highest because this is the most risky part of the entire retail portfolio number one because it's unsecured and second because it is not because it is revolving in nature it does not have any maturity time period hence this is the most risky portfolio right So obviously, uh, now one very important thing is you'll see that the way the products under QRRE is structured, right? QRRE would comprise a majority of the bank's segment. Because if you think about, you know, each of these products or each of these broad uh, sub, sub portfolios under retail, you'll see that QRRE is most risky. The reason is, you know, mortgages are home loans, right? Your other retail loan comprises of personal loans, auto loans, and so on. Now let's think about the so our auto loans in other retails, mortgage and QRRE. How would a default occur? Let's say you lose a job, right? You don't have the repayment capacity, and you have a savings to thrive on. So how would you do this? So over there, what you would see is that in other retail. So mortgages would be the least or, or would have the least chances of default because with whatever money you have, you'll first try to pay your home loan or the EMI of your home loan because you know that if you don't pay that, the bank is going to take your house away and you don't want that. That's the last thing you would want. So you first pay your mortgages and hence the chances to before you, before you default on mortgage is lowest. Next, you know that if you don't pay this, your uh, pay your auto loan, the guy is going to bank is going to take your car away. What you do is, next you pay your bank loan, uh, your auto loan. Now, when these two are paid, with whatever is left, you know you 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 will try to pay your credit card bills because you know that if you, if you don't pay that bill, the bank the what at most what can happen is the bank can close your card. So nothing really actually it doesn't impact your living. You can you can work in cash. Right. So what? So the way the cycle actually goes around, you know, the side the way 
this particular cycle actually goes around you will see that so you will see that this particular thing or uh, you uh, so basically you see that that if someone loses a job or if there is a deterioration in the repayment capacity of an individual the first part where it would hit the bank is the QRRE portfolio because this is something which the borrower spends right on on this particular using the particular product but if you take this particular product away it is not going to hamper his basic needs of like you know automobile has the basic need uh, home loans have a basic need so 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 they are a part of the basic needs of the borrower but QRRE products are not like that and this is what makes QRRE products the more riskier products and hence the rate of interest on these products are also very high and obviously yes there are multiple kind of variables there are certain key variables which we need to look into for this particular case now coming to the next part which is your mortgages now mortgages are nothing but your home loans right and we have in the last class when we discussed the global financial crisis we saw that it was the home prices which had suddenly gone up and, uh, and like homes were kind of a speculative asset which was there in the market and was being traded and everything was happening around that right so basically mortgages play a very important role in a bank's portfolio because exposure wise qrres are lower tend to be lower than mortgages the mortgages would have relatively lower number of bookings compared to credit cards but uh, compared to the qrre section but mortgages will have a higher uh, what should i say but mortgage will have a relatively higher exposure right so but one very uh, but two very important characteristic of mortgages are number one is that it is secured it's secured and number two is it is a fixed term product so basically when you take the person when you take the loan the mortgage loan to buy a home or you will take the home loan you know that that you have to repay it back in the next 5 10 year uh, in the next uh, 20 25 years right so you know that buying a house would be relatively easier so similarly if i talk about the other retail uh, exposures right the other retail has yeah so the other retail combines uh, or, or is a combination of both you know secured as well as unsecured loans but all loans in the other retail segment are term loans they are term loans now given that they are term loans so given that they are term loans there are two types of loans which are there <clears throat> the first set of loans that i have over here is uh, so when we talk about term loans right the first set of loans uh, so when we talk about retail loans 
the consider loans are unsecured loans now what are the other uh, types of the unsecured loans the unsecured loans are nothing but your personal loans your pl right so in the other retail uh, other retail exposure segment uh, sub portfolio of the retail portfolio the first thing that we have is pl personal loans or other such loans you know you have you take a loan for a honeymoon or you take a loan for a marriage or you take a loan for education or something like that so that's a pl now the other type of loans that i have are the secured loans secured loans comprise uh, you know your automobile loans uh, so your secured motor loans smns right it or you know other kind of uh, loans which are there like education loans so education loans sometimes may be uh, secured as well right so 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 there are so other retail comprises of both secured versus uh, as well as unsecured loans right and that is the reason why you know you can actually rank the uh, products in, in the retail segment in terms of their aprs the highest apr is of the qrre products like credit cards overdrafts and so on this is followed by the other retail segments right the other retail exposures on personal loans that is on unsecured loans of a fixed tenure right. the next that we have is of auto loans the rate of interest is of auto loans which is a secured uh, other retail portfolio with a definite term and finally the lowest rate of interest is generally on the mortgages right because it's a secured loan it's a term loan right so and, and it's secured right from the beginning in case of a default the loss given default would be relatively lower hence that the, a lower amount of risk needs to be passed on to the pricing hence the rate of interest for mortgages are relatively low so this is how the entire retail portfolio is structured for a given bank and now each of these products that i talked about be it your credit card be it your overdrafts be it your personal loans everything right so they have certain important characteristics from their exposure point of view so we we'll next analyze the key characteristics of these products and the exposures that they generate we will try to assess the riskiness associated with each of these exposures right so let's have a quick discussion on that so let's start off with credit cards now a credit card is identified by a very uh, a by you know very, by very two important things two important characteristics the first is so the the two most important characteristics are number 1 two most important characteristics over here are number one is balance balance and the second is limit limit so these are the two defining characteristics of a credit card so what is the balance the balance is the the let's start from the limit so the limit is the line of credit that has been approved to the borrower so limit is the loc i mean the line of credit granted to the borrower
the LOC is a line of credit which has been granted to the borrower. This is the maximum amount of credit which the guy can use in a given cycle, right? Now the balance is act is the actual balance which has been used, right? So this is what we call the outstanding balance as at the date of generation of the bill. So when the bill is always being generated at the cycle date, right? So that that's where you know you have your outstanding balance. The outstanding balance. So this shows that how much of the total granted limit have you used in on the card, right? So this limit and balance are two very important figures or two very important characteristics for a credit card product. Now the question that comes out over here is that if we're looking into the limit or we're looking into the balance separately, I cannot make out anything, right? I cannot make out the sources of riskiness of a card. So the next thing that we do is we look into a variable which is comprised of these two variables and we call this with that variable the utilization variable. So the utilization variable is the variable which combines the balance and the limit and gives us an idea about how much of the balance, uh, how much of the limit has been used up as a balance. So utilization is is balance the balance by the limit. Right, so the balance by the limit will give me an idea about how much or what proportion of the balance have I used up relative to the limit. Right, so that's what utilization is. And given everything else unchanged between the borrowers, a borrower with a higher utilization can be a more risky borrower. Therefore, in order to assess the riskiness of a borrower for a credit card, utilization is a key variable. However, that does not always mean that that a borrower with a higher utilization will always be a high risk borrower. If there are certain patterns in the utilization variable which we can check, right? You know, which we can check in order to understand that yes, uh, the borrower is a risky borrower. So not only the utilization patterns, but the changes in the utilization pattern is what matters the most, right? So that's what we are trying to do over here. Now, when we say that, let's say there are two borrowers, right? Let's say uh, Seva is a borrower and Chetan is a borrower, right? Now, I see that the utilization of Chetan is 80%, whereas that of Seva is 50%. Does that necessarily mean that uh, Chetan is a more risky borrower than Seva? Not necessarily, right? Because, because what would happen over here is that you may be using your card more, right? Or you may have a greater limit because you had a greater affordability. But what matters most and where, where the riskiness of a credit card arises is through the willingness of the borrower to pay back. So as a modeler, I would always be interested in tracking the willingness of a borrower. I would, I would try to always track the willingness of a borrower to pay back. The question that comes out is that how do I know that the borrower's willingness to pay or WTP as we call it, right? So the question that comes out is that how do I identify the willingness to pay or as the abbreviation that I would use going forward is WTP. Right. 
So how does how do I work work it out around that? So to obviously, uh, if there are two borrowers and one has a higher utilization, I am not concerned about the higher utilization of the borrower until and unless you know he has a higher utilization which is not supported by a sufficient payback, right? So when I talk about the willingness to pay, uh, the next thing that we'll talk about over here is. We need to understand how much of the balance he actually pays back, and that is where, in order to capture this willingness to pay, we define the next important characteristic or the next important definition with a credit card, which is your payment balance ratio. So basically, how much of payments have we completed in a given cycle? Right. So, how much of payments have we completed in a given cycle, divided by, or relative to the overall balance? So that is where you know we have the payment balance ratio. So the next question that we come up to over here is that if 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 I want if we want to assess the riskiness associated with the borrower. I would not only be looking into his utilization, but I'll also look into his payment balance ratio. So this is what the payment balance ratio is, P by D. Right. So so over here, what I have is I have the payment balance ratio, right? So when I have a look into this payment balance ratio, the next thing that we would like to understand over here is that how is it that <coughs> that uh, so basically when we have a look into this payment balance ratio, so what we want to know is that that how is it that this two utilization and the payment balance ratio comes in together? Let's say let's say when Seva has a utilization of fifty percent, right? His payment balance ratio is eighty percent. So it means that out of the fifty percent that he uses on his card, he pays back eighty percent of it, right? So, uh, sorry. Let's say uh, Chetan. Chetan has a utilization of eighty percent, and his payment balance ratio is sixty percent. So it means that out of the eighty percent on the card that he uses, if he says that he pays back sixty percent of that. Right and twenty percent gradually revolves. For Steva, it was fifty percent, and then what he did was, uh, let's say, he his payment balance ratio was only ten percent. So it meant that he used fifty percent of the balances, but he was paying back only ten percent. Therefore, the willingness of the borrower to pay back for Steva would be relatively lower than compared to Cheta. Right, and hence for the bank, Steva would be a relatively more risky borrower compared to. Chetan. So, so that's the entire idea, you know. So, <clears throat> the entire idea of comparing between the utilization and the willingness to pay of the bank, right? So, you know, to identify the willingness to pay, you just need to look into the payment balance ratio, right? And you look into the utilization and you plot them over time, and you see how is it the difference between these two is growing. Right, if you see that there is a very huge difference between these two, and and it's perhaps growing over time, you know that okay, the borrower who had a higher utilization or borrowers with higher utilizations are relatively uh, riskier if their payment balance ratio is relatively lower. So, will the will utilization and the payment balance ratio together will give us an idea about the willingness to pay. And the higher, the, the better the willingness to pay of the borrower, lower are his chances of defaulting in the next twelve months of performance. Clear? So the next thing that we uh, that we will talk about over here is the. So you talk about utilization, and right? we talk about willingness to pay. We talk about the payment balance ratio. The next thing that we will talk about over here is, and which is very important, is the head. Now the headroom for a card is, or headroom for a credit card, is defined as 
the limit minus the balance. So headroom is nothing but the amount of unused balance. So this is precisely your, you know, off book item, your off balance sheet item. So headroom is The headroom is equal to limit minus the balance. And higher the utilization will be, lower will be the headroom of the borrower. So if the utilizations are very high, then the headrooms are actually very low. And that is where, you know, it creates the problem. So that is where we find problems associated with uh, instabilities in the headroom values or in the headroom patterns. Right? So that's what, or so that's where this challenge would actually come in. So basically what we'll try to do over here is, we'll look at each of these figures, right? And we'll try to capture or we'll try to talk about the different aspects of PD, LGD, EAD, which I would expect to see in the data once I start working with it. So over here, when I talk about this, so what is this headroom uh, that is there? It's the unused balance, right? If I'm talking about it as an unused balance, this is nothing but my off balance sheet. So this is your off balance sheet item. Now, now when we talk about this off balance sheet item, right? You know, so when we talk about this off particularly this off balance sheet item, right? Now this off balance sheet item is used in deciding the exposure of, uh, or, or uh, is used in deciding the exposure at default for the bank and that's where you know your concept of CCF and credit conversion factor comes in because obviously whenever you are using a credit card or you're looking to credit card account you know that so there would be a certain amount of balance which would be there right and there would be a certain amount of balance uh, which would not be there so basically uh, if my limit is total if my total limit is one lakh right then If my total limit is one lakh and I use forty thousand, so my on balance sheet I balance is forty thousand. My off balance sheet item is fifty thousand. So therefore, one before defaulting, I can actually draw down that amount and then I can enter into default, right? So therefore, when I'm computing my exposure at default, I need to take into account both this on balance sheet and the off balance sheet item, right? And that's where the concept of credit conversion factor. Ideally, comes in. 